Uh, so I'm really, really pleased that we've got William uh, Martin here to talk about International Rescue Corps, which is the uh, uh, work and well, we'll be able to do a bit work in um, accessories and stuff like that. The reason that I'm really pleased about the fact that we managed to uh, get William to do is because there is a humanitarian uh, wing of OpenStreetMap.org called uh, the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Team Pod. And uh, they do some work with disaster aid, but I think one of the greatest things that, that I'm, I'm really quite of is the way that people are making a genuine difference in a lot of different countries. Uh, and by the work that we're doing, we're persuading um, different uh, bureaucracies and councils to, be, to appreciate the work and see how they do. you can't really get long-term development without a map. But uh, we also, it's really interesting to see what it's like to have, uh, be the front line and not have any much at all when you're having to deal with some really serious stuff. So, um, uh, like the Friday, Friday group, I'm going to. Thanks very much. I'm clap before they start, that probably means you're not getting it at the end. <laughs> what I'd like to do this afternoon is Take a bit of time, tell you a wee bit about what we do, show you some of the places we've been, and then hopefully have a bit of time at the end for questions, stroke, discussion on areas where we overlap. Having said that, I make this rubbish up as we go along. So if you've got a question that's relevant, often it's easier to answer if pictures still up there. So if you have got something you want me to clarify, please feel free just to shout out. Now, I'd ask you not to be at school and put your hand up or anything, because sometimes I don't see it. But just shout out, and it's often to say very much a case of pointing to someone in the picture. I'll start with a couple of apologies. One in case you meet my wife, because I managed to slip on my lunch, so I've got a stain on my shirt, yeah, which I've tried to cover up. Um, secondly, I've got to leave the phone there. Unfortunately, I've managed to mute it, but we are on call 365 days a year, so I can't completely switch it off. So if it goes, you might need to give me a couple of seconds to see who it is. Where do we start? You're probably sitting there saying to yourself, who, what is the International Rescue Corps? It's a charity who I'm very proud to say employ nobody, meaning that for every single person involved, it's nothing more than a hobby. We are 32 years old. We were formed as an official charity in 1981. And our constitution says we'll provide a fully trained, fully equipped, self-contained rescue team to any country in the world following any type of disaster, irrespective of that country's race, religion, or politics. And most importantly, that we will supply that help totally free of charge. There is no means testing. Anybody in need of that help gets it. We became, we started our life as an earthquake rescue team. We became involved in natural disaster rescue very, very quickly. We got dragged into relief work. All this happened overseas. But in the last 15 years, especially the last five or six years, with the advent of Civil Contingencies Act, we are now busier here in the UK than we are with anything overseas. <clears throat> Alongside that, we have got involved in training other teams, both in the UK and overseas, and we're now getting dragged into disaster preparedness. And disaster preparedness has a huge overlap in a lot of the things that you do, because the preparedness usually starts around about a mark off the area the prediction of what that disaster might do to it and how you can reduce that potential impact. But it really does start with a map. It might be a very simple map, like a blank sheet of paper with an X on it, or a very complex map, depending on where you're asked to work. That very briefly is who we are and what we are. What I'd like to do is Push on, show you some slides. All the slides are taken at real incidents. We've done 37 major world disasters. We've been involved 
in incidents in virtually every corner of the world. The pictures, as I say, are all taken at incidents, so some of them might be a wee bit grainy because we really are not photographers and we don't have a lot of time, and especially some of the older pictures. What I'd like to do is start as a history itself and have a look at an earthquake. The one we're going to have a look at is the earthquake in Turkey in 1999. It hit the city of Duce. There was actually two earthquakes hit that location inside just a few weeks of each other. All these pictures are taken at the first. We were back at the second one, but to be honest, nobody was saved. Very few people were even injured because the people hadn't moved back into the properties. They were still sleeping out in the camps that had been set up. This is very typical of the types of building in that particular part of the country. On the, the lower floors, you've got your commercial property, offices, shops, small factories, garages, could be absolutely anything, with domestic property on the upper floors. Do we have any geography teachers or seismologists in the audience? Oh, there's one put his hand up. When I'm finished, he's going to give you a talk about all the different kinds of earthquakes. There's lots of different kinds and they're affected by P waves and S waves and that affects the type of damage. We try to simplify this for people when we're trying to explain what's happened here. The type of damage that happened in Duce, we term it straight line damage. And the easiest way we've got to make people understand it, other than the experts, is to say if you hold your hand up and look at it, Every one of us, our hand is different. Some people have got great big spaces between their fingers. Some people have got long, thin fingers, we fat fingers, we tiny spaces, great big spaces, different angles. Some people's hands seem to open at 90 degrees. The earthquake, the epicenter, is the palm of your hand. The damage travels like your finger in more or less straight lines coming out from it. We don't know what these lines, what they'll be like. We fat fingers, big long fingers. We don't know the space in between them. If your building is on top of one of these lines of damage, it very probably will be very badly damaged if not totally destroyed. But if it's on the space in between these lines of damage, these waves, it can survive with virtually no damage. And this is very typical of what happened in this particular earthquake. If we pan off to the left hand side and have a wee look, you can see there is a bit of damage to the centre of that. But when you look at it, it can't be that bad. We guys have been in, got his budgie and brought it in the cage. So why were we there? If we go back to where we started, and then this time pan across to the right hand side, they're sitting on one of the fingers. Very, very similar kind of building, total destruction come down. The earthquake happened at night, so we would hope most of the people would actually be in the domestic property within these upper floor areas. Fortunately, and it doesn't always happen, there's a lot of concrete here. And whenever you've got concrete, it doesn't crush completely flat. You tend to get spaces, voids. If you can locate the voids, there's a chance there's people alive within them. It's a very modern city. No matter how quickly we respond, I came from Grangemouth through to here. If I came with an emergency vehicle with blue lights, sirens, bells, whistles, it'll take me what, 30 minutes to get here. You, the local people, will have started some kind of rescue work before I could possibly arrive. And that happens all over the world. They brought in lorries to move the rubble, they've cut it into huge big slabs, lifting it out the road, breaking the building up to get in to try and rescue people. But if you look at that, is it actually rescue work? If that machine can smash its way through a half metre thick piece of concrete, what's it going to do to somebody lying underneath it? Is it body recovery rather than rescue? And if you look at them, all these machines are on tracks. You ever stood at the side of the road when one of them rumbles past doing the road repairs? Everything vibrates. The gentleman will say use riddles in the garden and the girls probably bake a wee bit. 
how do you sieve flour? You bang all the flour into the sieve, you vibrate it, all the fine stuff falls through. You vibrate that heap of rubble, all the fine stuff falls through into the lower areas and buries anybody that's in them. The other thing that happens, the last picture in particular, that one, wasn't that clear. Why? Dust. Dust created mostly by these machines. Dust doesn't just come out the way, it goes in the way as well. 80% of all the old people that die following the actual collapse die from asphyxiation. You couldn't keep the air out of that building. There's so many spaces it's going to find its way in. But when you listen to the telly, you hear them say people are dying because of lack of oxygen. No, the truth is they're dying because we, the rescue workers, are killing them. We seal their nose, their throat, and their mouth with that dust. So when we arrive, we try actually, our first job is to try and stop that. And we take a totally different approach. We try to locate where every individual survivor is and then cut tunnel or shaft directly to that person. It's a very slow process. Almost all our location work is done by electronics. We use sound, temperature, visual imaging. We can track you by your exhaled breath. We can actually track that coming through the rubble. But it's a very slow process. A building of that size is probably about 15, 16, maybe 24 hours to fully search it. Time's our biggest enemy. People can only stay alive for a very limited period of time. So there has to be a quick method. When God invented dogs, he gave them a fabulous gift. We don't have our own dogs. A whole host of reasons for that. The best dogs come from mainland Europe. They don't come to this country at all. That's a Belgian dog. What would take us 15 hours takes that dog 10, maybe 15 minutes at most. Nips across the site and it indicates the good dogs will only tell us that there's somebody buried, they'll actually tell us whether that buried person is alive or dead. They are that good. But what they can do is smell through solid concrete. So what they're actually saying to you is that that void or at that crack or that crack, that's where the scent's coming out. That gives us a starter for tenants, they say. And we can bring all the electronics. And instead of searching, searching this huge big area, we start where the dog indicates. And our average search time is down to less than an hour to actually locate people. Made a huge difference. Once you know where they are, we'll work our way in. We'll tunnel into them. We've got all kinds of breakers, electric demolition hammers. We've got diamond cutting chainsaws that could whip these beams, these pillars straight out. But what we try to do in the first instance is get through to the casualty without doing any of that. Because all the tools create vibration, they create dust. What we want to do is get in, protect the casualty. If I move that bit of rubble out the road, is it actually supporting that beam? I don't know. So what I need to do is prop it up. But can I get a prop in just this one side? It might well just push it over that way. What if the casualties lying more than that side? So what we actually have is somebody getting wriggling through. There's his elbow, there's their knees, there's the soles of their feet. The idea is to get through, protect the casualties airway, put a dust mask, a respirator on them, some kind of respiratory protection. Maybe have to move them, put prop in on both sides so something can move and then move the rubble. We'll become masters at getting through small spaces. And you're sitting there going, how does fatty get through a space? And what stops you getting through a space? Your brain. Your brain says you can't even get through. If we can get our safety helmet through, we can actually get somebody through that space. It's convincing your brain it can be done. In fact, you just shove it out the road, it actually moves a bit. And you can squeeze it through as long as your brain tells you that it's, that's all right. You hold your breath for a couple of seconds, you squeeze another bit in, you grab another breath. It's the brain that controls it. 
So we'll plan to do that. Very unusual to be able to show you actually a rescue, a set of pictures. Because you usually were too involved. But somebody actually took these pictures and gave us them. They've been speaking to a woman and they know she's actually alive. Now I have to tell you, we've all this stuff to locate people. It's not an exact science. It's affected by the building materials, the humidity, 101 different things. We've been speaking to a woman, we've been in contact with her with one of the electronic systems, and we know she's in that approximate area. They've cut that slab, put on a crane, pulled the slab that was originally lined in here like that, pulled that back. Now what they're going to do is very carefully hammer and chisel through that hole. Yeah, we could get a big electric breaker and batter it through in a couple of seconds. What if they're actually lying just subsurface? Yeah? So you've got to do it very carefully. Cut a small hole, open it up, have a wee look in, and you've really got to look at the faces on this one. Nothing. If you look at John, he's the guy, it's his decision to open this hole. There's a wee bit of doubt in his face. And you do begin to wonder, you know, if we've got it right. Open it up a bit more, and let the rebar out. Now look at Brian's face, there's a face that only my mother can know. <laughs> But it's definitely not saying, great, we've got somebody. But if you just look over here, you'll see they're nipping just another wee bit of concrete out. And when he nips that bit of concrete out, he actually hooked his finger over what looked like a bit of plywood, concrete board, did it a wee pull, and it fell down. And when it fell down, that woman's arm appeared. We know a wee bit about this woman. One of the guys was back a couple of years later on holiday and actually met her. I mean, the world's an amazingly small place. Her name was Birth Sam. She was 52 years old. She's never been out of the city. She speaks nothing but Turkish. Her life was run about. Her family, her husband had been killed, so she was very much herself. She didn't sleep very well. So she took two sleeping tablets every night. The world could have come to an end. She didn't know it. She went to bed, and then she woke up. Her clothes were lying on top of her, but she couldn't move very much. What had actually happened, the vibration to the earthquake walked her wardrobe across the room, the door swung open and it fell over her bed, so she was inside the wardrobe. That's how we nearly missed her. The bit of wood that John actually moved, that bit of wood there, is the side of the wardrobe, and he pulled that across and her arm fell out. She'd been buried for five days at that point. Total darkness, temperatures really that would melt most people. One of the odd things that happens, and if you've got any friends in the medical profession that can explain in great detail how it works, is that casualties die on us. Very, very quickly. They go from being pretty stable to becoming very unstable, and then very rapidly die. So even before we try and move her, you'll see they're trying to stabilise her inside and get fluids in there, keep her alive so that we can bring her out. A lot of what we do is called casualty-based rescue. The most important person is the casualty. And that leads to some oddball things. You probably all watch what, 999 Emergency, Highland Emergency, and you see them applying these collars and all the fancy backs when snivering before you can move somebody. In the confined spaces that these people are trapped in, you can't get any of it on. There's no way to log roll them, there's no way to do anything. So the best thing to do is move them as carefully and cautiously as you can, bring them out the way they're lying, then deal with what you've got. So she was lying sort of on her side, face down the way, and that's the way she's come out. Got out, put on a stretcher. Now imagine how this woman feels. She doesn't actually know what's happened to her. Remember, she had two sleeping tablets. She's overheated because of the temperature inside the wardrobe. She's dehydrated. She's hearing all this screaming and shouting going on. She doesn't speak anything but Turkish. She's been in absolute, total darkness for five days. 
We break through, we've got a helmet light on, it's dark o'clock, it's cold air rushing in. Every time we look at this poor woman, we're blind her. We're talking a foreign language, we've been working for over four days to get there. We haven't had a shower, a bath, even any semblance of a wash, so we're stinking. The guys have got a bit of a growth, at least the girls are just dirty. How does that woman feel? You know, realistically, we could be Martians breaking in there. Out on the stretcher, and then we stop. Why? To the guy in the white, holding a hand. He's explaining what's happened, and also what's about to happen. Because our medic's just about to start at the top of her head and finish at the soles of her feet. And he's going to give her probably the most thorough examination she will ever have. For an older woman, that could be quite upsetting if you didn't know what was happening. So you take two or three minutes, get somebody to explain to her, preferably a friend or a relative, in her language, what's happened, what's been done, what's about to happen. And it can so greatly reduce the chances of post-traumatic stress that's frightening. It's about dealing with it at the time. It's about putting the casualty, not us, at the centre of that rescue. As soon as they're finished, we she goes off to hospital. I can tell you now she had a very badly broken leg. And when the mate met her later on, she's got a bit of a limb. But that's all from it. And she actually hasn't suffered any post-traumatic stress at all that we've heard of. We don't just work at earthquakes and we don't just work overseas. This is Glasgow in 2004. You've probably all seen some of this. It's a place called Stockline Plastics. Plastics factory blew up by a gas explosion. If you think of where we started with our earthquakes, we probably have more experience of structural collapse than anybody else in the UK. Within the UK, we back up, we help the UK emergency services. So we were asked to go along and help Strathclyde Fire Brigade. There was three people rescued for that building alive. We helped with two of them. There was nine bodies recovered for that building, and we helped with seven of them. So for our happy wee charity, we actually did all right, and we are a very small organisation. As you look at that picture, there's actually two different stories in it. There's this one here, and there's one over there. Just keep that one in the back of your mind, we'll come back to it. This one over here, the bit he's got in his hands, a thing called a cobra cam. It's a very heavy duty, flexible endoscope. And what they were doing is they were cutting small holes through that roof, sticking the endoscope in, and visually, having a look round about, and kicked some of his cavalry. Having a look round about to see if there was anybody. Now, I asked, I put the scope in, and you couldn't see any, and it stuck. So like any good rescue worker, he did a damn good whack. And this woman's eye opened up, because he was actually bouncing it off her head. <laughs> and rescue worked about teamwork. There was, at that point in time, there was only seven of us on site. Five of you did hundreds of folk there. So we told them, they came along, they chopped this wee hole that size into a hole that size. The ambulance service are there, the police are there, the doctors are there. And they managed to bring that woman out alive. It's all about teamwork. Once that was finished, we go back and you can see the type of holes that we're cutting and actually scoping as they go over. We were there for 37 straight hours, right through the night. And at one point, that whole roof slab started to move. So we ended up trying to prop it in position so it could be moved. Now we don't do all this ourselves. Again, we do a lot of training with the Mind Rescue Service. And the Mind Rescue team was actually up from Yorkshire and over from Fife. And we work very well with them. We know them quite well. And between the two organisations, you'll see all the extra showroom and propping that's been put in to support that roof. Remember I said there was a rescue going on off, just off that picture. And we come back to it. The girls especially might have read this Linda, Linda Kimmins story. It's been in a lot of the girls' magazines. Very early on, the fire brigade found her. They got the medics in and they kind of stabilised her. And they tried to get her out. And she screamed. 
could remember. So the wine were full of morphine. She still screamed. Couldn't remember. The wine were full of ketamine. Still screamed. Couldn't remember. No matter what they did, no matter how they managed to access her, they just couldn't free this woman. So they come up with this fabulous idea. Any chance you can dig underneath, come up underneath her and see what's trapping her. The problem with the building had collapsed. The only safe access is away over here. So we had to tunnel over 40 metres through to get underneath her. There's the start of the tunnel as they go in. Now you'll see we'll put special props in to make it easy. And it looks huge. You think, that's great. Remember, we're not going to bring her out. We want to fear and she'll go out to the fire brigade. So the reality of it is that's the next space and that's the guy in front of him working their way through. And what they found when they got to her is she was definitely trapped. She had a six inch to two inch roof timber. Had went right through here, knocked the top of her leg out and asked her to come out through the middle of her hip. No wonder they couldn't move her and get her out. Because she were underneath, they simply cut it six inches back in front. For the younger ones, that's about that much. <laughs> and back in front. And the fire brigade lifted her out. Who actually saved her? What do you got a clue? Was it us? Was it the fire brigade? Was it the ambulance service? The doctors? The medical team in the hospital? The social workers? The psychologists that have brought her back to being almost healthy? Eh? No idea. It doesn't matter. If everybody pulls together, all the wee bits come together, even for that, people can survive. We started our life, as I say, as an earthquake rescue team, but we very quickly got dragged into other kinds of natural disasters. Very briefly, we'll have a look at this one. The Nevada del Ruiz volcano rescue. It had been inactive for about 100 years, maybe just over. It had a permanent ice cap. When it erupted, it didn't spew millions of tons of lava out. What it did is it melts the ice cap, boils it, mixed it with thousands of tons of volcanic dust and ash, and it sent it as a volcanic mudslide down into a valley, covered about 70, 77 square miles. And just here at the local market town, Armero, Armero had 26,000 people stayed in it, 21,000 of them were wiped too. We were asked to go in and make sure that there was no human left alive, either up a tree, in a building, or under any bit of debris. And we were the only team to work there 24 7. Why? If you looked at that, you'd have seen that area there. The largest single bit to be virtually undamaged, and probably the only bit that didn't matter a damn, because it's the local cemetery. Strange mixture of superstition and religion there. Because the cemetery survived, it was an indication that the whole place should be a cemetery. That's pretty close because there's 21,000 dead folk lying about. Superstition. You don't go into a cemetery after dark. There's ghosts and gremlins and all kinds of things. So any help that would come in would come in in a helicopter very early on, once daylight came. But then it would leave an hour or a couple of hours later, just in case the helicopters didn't come back, because there was no way they were going to be caught in this cemetery after dark. Rescues could be dead easy. Even a whole building was buried in mud virtually completely, doors and windows completely covered. If they held, the building could be as free of mud as this room. You were trapped, you were entombed, not physically injured or in any real danger. You just couldn't get out. So often all you had to do was get up on a roof, prize up that beautiful work there, drop a rope in, haul them out, and take them back to where we could get them away to safety. Floods all over the world have been a massive feature in the rescue work. Hurricane Mitch was probably the wettest hurricane there's been for a long, long time. It dumped millions of tons of water in Nicaragua and Honduras and right away through that central belt there. Two very, very poor countries. We were asked to see if we could go and help there. Now you've had time to look at that picture, so you've obviously recognised it, because you've, you know, it's very obvious. It's a little airfield at last time. It just looks like he thought. 
took us three days to get there. It's way up in the north. It's on the Rio Coco River. And it forms the border between Nicaragua and Honduras. And the border may just be a line on your map, but it could present all kinds of problems if you end up on the wrong side of it. That's Waspan, it's a bustling wee community, very typical of the housing, but why you were there, that, that's the real Coco River. There is a bit of a giveaway, the houses on stilts, so they're used to floods, but nothing in this sort of nature. That would be usually maximum 30 metres wide. It came out to over five clicks wide, five kilometres wide at that. The problem is, the houses are right on the banks, they're washed away. Their transport, mostly boats, is washed away. What's their food supply? Fish. Water becomes very turbid, lots of mud and slime in it. So the fish swim away or are washed away. So they lose their food supply. Biggest problem in a flood? Any what hazard I guess? Biggest single killer in a flood? Somebody said there, water. Fresh water. Clean water. Clean water. All the wells become contaminated. The wells are fed usually to seepage for that, but it comes through the geology, gets itself cleaned up. The time they get it, it's actually pretty clean. Might make you an eye ill, but because they're used to it, it's fine. That water tips into the well, contaminates it, now nobody can drink it. And there's more people lose their life because of lack of clean water in a flood than for any other single reason. It took us three days to get there. Contrary to popular belief, we don't go along, throw a wee rubber boat in the water, scoot about and rescue hundreds of people. If you could swim for three days with a current in that river, you'll have doggy paddled and you go up to a bank. It's never any more than a mile or a mile and a half away. And you'll have to go out. So you don't need rescue. And if you can't swim for three days, guess what? You're dead. So there's nothing we can do for you. So why do we go? There are actually two disasters within every one of these. There's the disaster, the earthquake, the typhoon, the hurricane, the flood. People are killed. The tsunami killed thousands. Went away. Following that disaster, though, there are people left alive, survivors. And a lot of them will die if they don't get food, water, medical aid, shelter, the help that they need to survive. Mapping plays a huge part in what happens with that second disaster, the control and coordination of it. You need to know where the people are, you need to know what their needs are. Most of you all have heard of Map Action. Map Action were contracted by the UN to produce maps of all these areas as disasters hit. Then, when the legs ourselves go and we feed information back to them, and a needs assessment. What do you find? How many people? What do they need? And they produce overlays to these satellite images. And what happens is if I turn up to 1010, I can bring a, an overlay down people need shelter and see where somebody needs 1010s. Make sure that there isn't any delay in getting them delivered. To get that information though, how do we do it? We do it by doing a thing called needs assessment. We were really lucky that boat had got washed down river, so we grabbed it because it's more comfortable than the wee rubber ones. And the outboard is actually ours. We were going to put it on a rubber down <coughs> didn't we? You then travel anything 60, 70, 80 clicks up or down river, and you start to bring in all the information. These people are used to disasters, so they know what the game is here. They've started to rebuild the wee village, put some housing back up, but they're showing us all the food supply they've got. It's rice, it's been wet, it's mildewed. It's not going to kill them, but it's really bitter. Not very pleasant to eat, but it'll not keep them going very long. So what do they need? 20 people a kilo of rice each is 20 kilos. Yeah, dead easy. Unless I throw you a bag of rice and say, you go and cook it, just with what's in that floor. Because you've lost a grain. You can't cook it. You need a pot. So your needs assessment is 20 kilo of rice plus a stove plus a cooking pot. They might be frying the rice, they might not even boil it. They're going to need clean water, they're going to need oils. If you change their diet, you produce all kinds of medical problems. 
So you've got to find out what they actually need, then make sure they get the right stuff. Sometimes it's a wee bit more complicated. There's another group that survivors, they're really well off. They've got some bamboo, they've nailed up these long houses, put some plastic sheeting on it. They're not lazy people, they're really hard working people. Two or three clicks away, there's a great supply of food and water. So what do they need? Good walk in the garden. They're walking about in their bare feet. I know none of these will actually remember the First World War, even I didn't. But you all heard the trench foot. Soldiers got it walking about in the mud. Inside three days, they had a form of trench foot. The flesh on their feet started to dry up and break up. The mud's really badly contaminated. They actually couldn't walk. Medically, it's dead easy to deal with that. Dry dressings, antiseptics, a couple of days you'll have them hobbling. Nobody will run a marathon, but they'll hobble a couple of miles to go and get some food and water. What happens the minute they step back into the mud? Cycle starts again. So what is it they need? Yes. Wellies. Where did you get wellies in the middle of Nicaragua? Power all that all thinking and a decent GPS. As we flew in at Miami Airport, they had a big feature on you know the big screen tellies about the British Royal Navy having a new ship HMS Ocean doing its proven trials off the coast. HMS Ocean is the Marines landing ship. So it's got lots of people, all the way up here at Wellies. It's got half a dozen helicopters. <coughs> yeah. This begins to make sense. So we phoned the British ambassador, who phoned the LOD, who phoned the Navy, <coughs> who phoned the Ocean, who phoned us back in the satellite, which at $10 a month I'm glad they were paying for. <laughs> we gave them a GPS location. It's a map reference. They threw some wellies into a helicopter that didn't even land. They flew over a couple of burly marines open up the back door and heave welly boots at you. <laughs> you broke the cycle. And because you've been able to give them that information. Sometimes it's very personal. You got a wee kiddie. I don't know if he's a mum's or dad's, but you didn't need him to be medical. Look at that. She's not got the gloss and the life in her eyes, is she? Her mum next powdered milk with dirty water and she's dumped my wife into her nappy. Costs about a pound to save that kid. Special rehydration crystals. Get them on it. it really is like turning a light switch if you get them quick enough. This, the diarrhea calms down and stops. All the electrolytes, the chemicals that they've been losing, they start to absorb them again. And in an hour, a couple of hours, that kid really shows a remarkable change. But you've got to be there you've got to have the ability to produce that fresh water. Now that you know that kid is there, though, you mark that onto the needs assessment and somebody makes sure that they get the food, get the water, get the well decontaminated <coughs> so that the ongoing needs are looked at. You can casi back them. What does that mean? You've probably all done it. Casi back in this country is dead easy. Telephone, 999 ambulance, thank you very much. Casually evacuated to hospital, casually evacuated. Out there, you only got a phone, but you have a sat phone, having an ambulance service. There is a hospital, but it's maybe 60, 70 clicks away. So you put the kiddie in a boat, and you run them down the river to get them back to last fan. The medical staff are good, they'll look after the injury, the illness, but what they don't do is look after the kiddie. So they don't feed them, change them, wash them, change the bed, anything like that. That's not their job. So who's going to do it? Mum. You take mum. It's not a excuse me, it's not a society that deals in cash very well. The barter or the exchange or give you an hour's work for, you know, a nice buffet lunch. And that's what I had to do here today. <laughs> so it does work. But if she's in the hospital looking after the kiddie, where does she get that food? She can't go to work for it. So take dad, he can work, get the food, mum can feed the kiddie. You take mum and dad, guess what? You've got to take the rest of the family. So you move somebody to the hospital, that's actually maybe a whole boatload to go down. And then a week, a few days later, you've got to take them back. Because they're miles away for all their support. In this country, things have moved on. This is Hull a couple of years ago. 
some massive floods. We've got our own specialist boats now. But the biggest traffic cone you've ever seen in your life. That's what it is. Exactly the same material. They're called Pioneer Maltese. The beauty of them is they've got a drop down bow. And what you do is you drive it up to people's doors, drop them down the road, and go in, get the old one, you take the hand, walk around, sit around a nice wee seat and take a for a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that so important? Well, it's about dignity. You imagine an 80 year old woman, maybe been widowed for a long dish time, lives herself, very little contact, middle of the night gets flooded. Two burly rescue workers, you don't know if they're male or female, because we all look the same with all this gentleman, run in, grab her, drag her out in her goody, grab her hand between her legs, throw her into her over boat, lying, soaking wet, lying on the floor, get her to the other end, drag her out, plonk her on it, then you say to the social worker, go and get a cup of tea, she'll be fine. After the Carolina floods, we went to a debrief and the social workers started slagging, not just us, but all the rest of the teams. So you don't look after your casualties. You've got to save the life of me, do you want? Well, they're shocked. They come in here. You would not believe the state, especially the older women. And they live a lot longer than us men. So it tends to be older women that need the help. You wouldn't believe the state, but in there must be a better way. And we actually thought about it. Now what we do is we walk them into this and then we walk them back out. And it's made a huge difference to get them there. That's the bow door on the wall. Just wide enough as you look at it, so we can actually let them take their zimmer, their wheelchair, their wee electric car, anything they want. There is still rubber boats in use, and then typically in cocker mouths, they had to be used. You couldn't get the bigger boats down some of the side streets. And there's the old woman coming out, and it looks dead easy, doesn't it? But the reality is that. If you map that flood off, the water doesn't come to this point and stop. The big puddle might stop there, but that's because there's a metre of rise. Eh? You go down the road another hundred metres, and there's actually a dip. With maybe only a half metre of water, but it's still a flood. The only way to get them out is in a commercial sized vehicle. You couldn't run a car through it. Who's the only people that would send a commercial into that? The fire service. And they ever had anything to do with a fire engine? First day 37 years on the building up. Trust me, that's the floor there. So you get this old woman who you're just shot, they drive her out in another boat, you haul her out, you get her up to that, then you get her, you put the hand on the back side to you, and you heave her up into the air, throw her in the back of that, they drive her out, and then you get to the other end and they drag her back out because she can't kind of climb down the steps. And nowadays, what we did after this is we've made arrangements with a local bus company that even if the bus is written off, we'll send a bending wee bus in. And we'll get it to that dry area. And we'll walk this old buddy on here. We've bought boats to help them. Let's get a bus to help them. And let's give them that dignity that they deserve. Interestingly enough, one of the problems is lack of maps, or lack of ability to see the roads. And even when the flood water disappeared, there are a couple of lorries that got it badly wrong. Yeah, they're big, yeah, they're boots, they can drive through deep water. But if you can't even see where you're going, it becomes quite awkward, because sometimes the keep left side doesn't mean much in a big <laughs> flat surface of water. It's hilarious, it is really funny. I was giving a talk to a group, and the boy, from Asda, the transport division was there. And he was telling us that had over 4,000 litres of earth on it. It lay for four days because they couldn't get the specialist equipment and to transfer it to pull it out. And it completely brought what is an open road just because of their stupidity. Where was he going to deliver it to the garages up in the water? <laughs> <laughs> we get involved in eight projects. And this is something that becomes, you know, how long is a bit of string. This project started in Cuba. It's a project called Salute. There was an ambulance driver for down south went on holiday. Why many years ago anybody went to Cuba? I have no idea. But Cuba is near a single island. It's all of three islands. He went to a very remote island, and what he found is they had had a really good health service. 
Cuban nurses and Cuban doctors are world famous. Fabulous medical staff, really good training. But the hospital was shut. By this stage, the old Soviet bloc had broken up, was bankrupt, and moved out. The Americans, for whatever reason, we don't want them politically involved in it, good to care less, have got an embargo on Cuba. So they've no transport to bring people in, staff or casualties. There's no equipment for the hospital. They don't have a syringe, a needle, a pair of gloves, a bottle of death, nothing. So they just shut the hospital. The staff are still going about though. And this guy came back and he had this fabulous notion. Right? We all know how good our health service is. They waste a huge amount of stuff. So he thought, I'll get an old ambulance, I'll fill it with all this stuff, and I'll send it over to that wee island in Cuba. And even if it's just for a few weeks, they'll maybe get that hospital going again. Couldn't he send an ambulance to Cuba? Couldn't he find any way to do it? So he got in touch with us because he knew we'd done some daft things. And he said to us, can you send an ambulance to Cuba? And guess what we found? Can you send an ambulance to Cuba? But you can send a ship to Cuba. If you're going to move people, what's the best things to move people? Buses. Some of these you've maybe been on. You came through the steps, bus carriage through Glasgow. You'll notice they're a wee tad full. <laughs> because we loaded them with containers with everything we could lay our hands on. The guys might know these. These are Leyland Tigers. Leyland Tigers were famous. There is no technology in them. When they break down, you hit them with a hammer. And if they work, you get a bigger hammer. They are that technological. So they don't break any embargo. We give them single deckers. We give them double deckers. Why just give them an ambulance service? And because there's lots of old fire engines. So we got some of them. The way we couldn't send them an ambulance, they sent them 72 of them. And for every tranny they got, they got three of the same model. Fabulous engineers out there. And they stripped the other two for spares to keep them running. And they sent it us doing it, because we loaded them like containers and sent them out. We had everything that the NHS threw out, including a complete operating theatre. We had half a million bars of soap, went there. Where did you get half a million bars of soap free of charge? The company that supplies Tesco's. Tesco's refused to take this batch because it was a half shade of pink out <laughs> for the rose scented soap. And it was cheaper for them to give us it if we picked it up and got rid of it than we actually try and reconstitute it, remix it, or do anything else with it. So we got all this kind of stuff, loaded it on, and sent it out by ship. It became the largest fully privately funded aid project ever to leave the UK shores. And we didn't send one ship, we sent two in consecutive years at 10,000 tons each. Was it worthwhile? If you'd taken it on Havana, that would have come and got you. They painted it, not us. Scrape the paint off, mid in West Wales ambulance service. The hospital where it all started with some of these old Wales darts. There's the guys that look after them. You'll notice they look relatively happy. Relative being a term because nobody's happy to get a lay on that. <laughs> Not the best vehicles in the world. Why are they so happy? They've been given a hand up. It's easy to give somebody a hand out, but you give them a hand up, they're now looking after their community. They've got their self-respect. They're boosting that community. And that's what this type of thing is all about. They also got one of the big buses which they painted up. Fourth Valley, a couple of years ago, totally new for us. Under the Civil Contingencies Act, we were required to help. And Fourth Valley Health Board came to us and said, help. Of course, there's a lot of white stuff going about. We have the District Nursing Service, we've got the Out of Hours Nursing Service, we've got the Home Birthing Unit, and we've got the Complex Care. We've got nurses trapped all over the place because they go out, do a shift, and they've got to come back home. We've got relief nurses, we can't get out. We've people needing palliative care at home, and we can't get them that pain relief. Their families are distressed. Is it rescuable? Probably not. But for 30 days straight through, we ran some four-wheel drives, 
Interestingly, the guy passing us there is on skis. That's the kind of housing estate we were having to get people in and out of. We're blue lighted, so we'd get called in an ambulance and we couldn't get into their place. We'd run in with one of our four wheelers, bring our cars out the out. The ambulance might have got in, couldn't get back out. We'd go in and tow them out. Or we would take our own ambulance and run them to the hospital. And we also found some odd things. These are all too young to do medication, but when you are, the doctor tends to have to do a series of blood tests. And especially in things like warfarin, you get a blood test maybe every week, every month, to decide on the levels, the dose that you should get. Very important that that's done. And they'll take all these samples. But in a lot of the villages, they couldn't get them into the labs. So when we were running about with the nurses and that, we used to pick up all these bath samples and take them in. As a rescue team, it's not our job to come and clear your path. But there's exceptions to every rule. This is a house in Bowness, just doing the water a wee bit there. What it does not show is that's virtually on a 30 degree slope up the way. It's relatively steep. It's about four inches of solid ice. The guy's staying in and needs dialysis three times a week. The ambulance service refused to take him out. It was too dangerous. So we were asked to see if we could help. If we couldn't, he was going to get lifted out in a specialist stretcher, taken to hospital and hospitalised, probably for the whole of that month. So we got a couple of the guys to go down, we chipped out that ice and we changed the original picture to that. Nothing at all to do with rescue work, but it is a bit better than the quality of people's lives. Because now all they've got to do is throw a handful of salt down and he can get his dialysis. He's got his quality of life still at home. Ladies and gents, that's a few of the things, the type of things we've been involved in. And if there is a few minutes left, I'd be delighted to try and answer any of your questions or discuss any of your points about the use of marketing in anything that we've been involved in. survived the earthquake 
in a tower above everything. So everybody knew where that tower crane was. Now we don't know if it's north, south, east or west. So what he did is he took another reference point. The sign for the post office was something that everybody knew where it was. So he goes to his map and he draws that. So there's the sign, there's the tower crane. Hey, you go and mark on where you've been working. So again, you know, we don't need to be too technical. Well, the tower crane was in front of me, that was behind me, and I was slightly, actually, it was more on my left, so I was over here someplace. You pass the marker in, and you actually go, no, it was on my right, so I must be over here. Now, eventually we'll find out what's north and south, and eventually we'll find the scale is absolutely rubbish. But all of a sudden we know, well I don't need to go and work there because you've been there. I don't need to go to this side because you've been there. And that map made the speed back earthquake actually workable. And that's the quality map that works in the early stages. The maps for the second stages can be really, really complex. We were involved in the genocide in Rwanda and we would get sent, you get told there's, you know, Big box of medical supplies got to go to Kashushu Khan. Right, so where's that? It's in Zaire. Right, can you narrow it down a bit? <laughs> and basically, there wasn't a map. We couldn't get a map. And the only way to travel was to go and get somebody local and start and go along the back road. Do you know where Kashushu is? Do you know? And eventually, he did. So you kidnapped him for a day. He showed you how to get there. And you have to do that all the time. What you needed was a map with all the camps, a north, south, east, or west, so at least you could use a compass. And they just didn't exist. And that's where organisations like yours coming into that second, third phase can deal with that amount of information. I hope that sort of half answers what you're asking. I was just going to add a, sorry, I was just going to add a comment. So OpenStreetMap map patch and I'm using OpenStreetMap. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, OpenStreetMap has have actually been deployed to like the Philippines and Haiti yeah. after disasters to do that mapping and also as well as the stuff in the banks. Mm -hmm. So those links between OpenStreetMap and map action are there. Yeah. Yeah, there is a open source piece of software called uh, Sahana, I think, for yeah. disaster management. Yeah. Uh, I think it was deployed in Haiti. Can I give you a wee hint? And I'll get better and start dying off. Right? Technology means a phone that makes phone calls. <laughs> it's not a smartphone and it's not a laptop. So when we talk about a lot of this stuff, it's got to be readily available. We don't have power on a lot of these disaster sites to power up to charge laptops and things. So it's got to be something that can be printed and stuck in your back pocket. And, and one of the Big issues we've found, and I'm not going to go into the organisations by name, is that they've relied on technology that we can use. Because the cell towers are down, so the phone networks are away. We can't charge the rechargeable batteries, and they make nothing nowadays that uses a decent disposable battery. And so we've got to find a way to take, yes, the technology to produce it, but we need to be careful that the technology doesn't stop us using it as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I was just going to say, I mean, there's, there's this difference, there's this polarised difference between, for example, your, your um, Royal Navy helicopter, mm -hmm. and they don't care what the village is called, what the GPS call is, yes. the drop down to the yes. And then the people on the ground have no idea what the GPS call is at all, yeah. but they do know the name of their village and the name of the neighbouring village. Mm. And it's actually, this is a really polarised thing. So, you know, you one, 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 one solution that's trying yeah. to unify with yeah. that. Yeah, right. And that's one of the massive problems. That's why wherever, typically on an earthquake rescue, every time we locate something, we are having signed up to the UN Charter, we've got to take a GPS location. If it's a big building, we take the four corners plus the location that the body's actually found or the survivors found, because they kind of get people to agree in street names. They kind of work out what the street is because all the buildings are formed together. And they tie it down by GPS, although locally we might have been told it's Smith Street, Galloway Street or that, means nothing to the UN. 
and it really becomes a mishmash, and it's very, very hard to tie all this together. A very technical answer is the GPS, and the simple answer is the local giving you the, the village or the street name. And I've got to find a way to bring them up together. And I don't knock technology. Technology makes my job function. But we've got to be very careful that we can use the hammer and chisel and not just the electric breaker. Because there's times, the old fashioned way sometimes the better. And it's been a really hard message to get to people. Map Action have planned everything round about. They set up their nozzle. Yeah, I was talking to a great name but anyway, what's an also? I have said that a thousand times. The on-site office of coordination and communications for the UN in any disaster scene. And they move in pallets of paper and laptops and printers and everything's binding on there. It's a f the B the BBC will have a set up like this. It's slow, it's cumbersome, it relies on getting the fuel for their generators because they can't function without electricity in that. And until that's up and running, until the fuel supply is sorted out, you need to have something that we can do without the technology. When that's up and running, it's fabulous. Map action, or overlays, everything works perfectly. But if I can't switch it on and get that, it's a no use to me. And like the information is polarised, you have nothing or you seem to have everything. Can you make it function in the middle? Can you bring that together? And that's the challenge. Well, this, the gentleman. Do you, do you see yourself playing any role in educating people uh, such as I think always uh, clean water here if that was or any we have we've got really involved in the disaster preparedness. I was in Bangladesh just the tail end of last year and we were doing an earthquake preparedness thing in um, Dhaka. And the idea was we were asked to go out by a, a, a rather large aid, large aid agency and see if we could make their building a wee bit safer and look after their staff. And it grew hands and legs when we were out. And the start here was that we were told 50% of the city would die in the big earthquake that's now overdue. There are 16 million people registered as staying in Dhaka. There's probably twice that amount that I'm not registered. That's 8 million people going to die. Now, I don't know about you, I work with death. I cannot imagine 8 million people lying about. So we started and we went with a seismologist from Edinburgh Geological Survey and we thought right, we'll do a quick assessment to see if that becomes you know, a realistic figure. And we started going about the city and to be honest, what we found shocked us. It is a realistic figure and if it's unrealistic, it's unrealistic because it's probably 70 or 80% that will die. The annoying thing about it is that we spent 24 hours trying to find out if that was realistic. They had just spent half a million quid doing a mapping exercise at DACA that we could have read that one in less than five minutes. And it's locked in a beautiful glass fronted cabinet <laughs> in one of the ministries. And you'll not say who in case you happen to know them. And nobody but nobody gets the key. It's a great invention in a big book. Sorry? A big edition of the ministry. Yes. Yeah. Paid for by the United Nations, uh, by the EU. But they've got the information and it's made available to nobody because that information is power. Lorana Plaza, in Castlevine's back a few months, fell down a textile factory. A uh, thousand people killed, two thousand rescued. Rana Plaza, they were told when we were out in November that place was going to fall down. Six story building, extended above, factory, domestics, 
extend it because the building code's now changed. You don't rebuild, you just add another six storeys, so the foundations are crap. You've got a factory in the middle with all the way to the textile machines, a couple of storeys of houses, and then what do you put on the roof? The biggest and heaviest set of generators you can find, and which run the best part of the quarters of the day because of power cuts, and then you wonder how the building falls down. You could find the Lana Plaza on the mapping saying that it was at risk. But nobody gets to see the mapping. Yes, we are becoming involved. I did a talk uh, a week and a half ago down in London to earthquakes without frontiers. And there was professors from seven different countries there wanting to drive this type of thing, make the information available. And we're getting dragged in to help them with that. We're a very practical organisation. I really don't understand. They said earlier, can you use a Mac? I don't even know what a Mac is. Mac to me is an Apple with me. And there's people understand that technology. And we need to bring both of these together. And that's where we, we're attempting to get involved with. I know we're kind of... Right, 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 okay. Thank you very much.